Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on the MOOC video course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. Uh, so far we have looked at two important aspects as far as the course is concerned in general. The first thing is about the probability theory and the second is about financial markets and asset pricing model. From today's class, we will start the main topic and focus of this course namely portfolio theory. And we will begin with by talking about the modern portfolio theory which is also known as the mean variance analysis. So the mean variance analysis owes its origin to the seminal work of Harry Markowitz in 1952 wherein uh, for the first time Markowitz basically gave a proper structure to how a judicious decision that can be made in terms of an investment decision. So prior to Markowitz's uh, theory coming into existence there was no clear and well defined manner in which investment decisions were made and this led to a huge amount of losses in a lot of cases for the investors. But Markowitz for the first time identified that one cannot simply judge the potential of an investment in a risky asset by the return it gives because very often you observe that assets which offer a very high return are also associated with a high amount of risk. And he identified that both return and risk should be taken as the two pillars when deciding on an investment strategy. And accordingly, the foundations for the modern portfolio theory or what is equivalently known as the mean variance theory was laid down. So we start off with this lecture. So this is lecture number 7. So we, as I pointed out, uh, the Markowitz theory is based on two pillars namely return and risk. So uh, we now uh, begin our discussion on the mathematical portfolio theory with an uh, with the initial stages being devoted to the Markowitz theory. Uh, so I can say that the design of a portfolio and I will explain later what is a portfolio. So uh, uh, on a very informal level a portfolio is a collection of assets both risky and risk free. So the design of a portfolio involves something called the choice among thousands of alternative of bonds, stocks and other financial instruments such as derivatives. Now the portfolio management process typically involves three steps and I will briefly uh, describe about these three steps. So these three steps are uh, security analysis. portfolio analysis and portfolio selection. So uh, let us go through this uh, one by one. So the first one is the security analysis. So basically a portfolio manager 
uh, what he or she does is that the security analysis means that they will look at the securities, particularly risky securities such as stocks and they will analyze those stocks and then they will rank them in order of the desirability. So, basically amongst the thousands of choices, what they will do is that they will pick up certain amount of stocks which in their opinion are better investments in terms of return balanced against the risk. So, once these stocks are chosen, the next question that arises is how are you going to distribute your wealth among the different stocks. So, suppose you have decided that you want to invest in 10 stocks and you start off with an amount of say uh, 10,000. So, then the next question is that how about what should be the distribution of this 10,000 that you want to invest in stocks that means how much money should you allocate uh, to each of the stocks so that the sum adds up to 10,000. And there are many different ways this can be done and the final step would be basically figuring out what is the best way to make this allocation amongst different portfolio choices. So, for example, uh, I have a certain amount of money and that money can be used to buy these 10 different stocks in different proportions and then it becomes a question of optimizing that which amongst those different ways of creating a portfolio is going to be the best choice. So, that is why I say that the first step is security analysis, look at, at the level of the risky asset. The next is portfolio analysis, where basically we analyze the different uh, portfolios that you can construct out of those chosen securities and finally, we make a portfolio selection out of them. Okay. So, now next, uh, so uh, as I said uh, as a prelude to this discussion, so the backbone of uh, modern portfolio theory. Uh, which is due to Markowitz involves two parameters and these two parameters these are return and risk. So, before I start the discussion on return on risk, uh, let me enumerate uh, some of the behavioral assumptions. Uh, and these behavioral assumptions are the ones which drive the portfolio theory and these are enumerated below. Uh, so, by behavioral assumption I basically mean that uh, what is the thought process uh, that goes on uh, in, th in the minds of a rational investor while deciding on how to make an appropriate choice of the portfolio. So, accordingly let me enumerate all of them. So, the first uh, behavioral assumption that I take into account here is that all investors assess each investment opportunity from the point of view or the paradigm of the probability distribution of returns. Secondly, an investor's assessment of the risk associated with an investment opportunity is proportional to the variability in the returns. Thirdly, investors decision are mainly based 
on the expected risk and uh, sorry uh, this is expected return just make this correction and uh, risk statistics and 4 for a given level of risk the investors prefer higher return to lower returns. So, let me explain this one by one. So, let us look at point number one. The point number one says that all investors they will basically make an assessment of each of the investment opportunity uh, from the point of view of the probability distribution of returns. So, as you can see that whenever you are looking at returns, a return is uh, basically the percentage gain that you make over your initial investment and that is going to be a random variable and consequently obviously it is going to have a probability distribution. So, the first thing that the investors take into account is the probability distribution of the returns. Secondly, they also need to make an assessment of the risk that is associated and the risk is seen as the variability that means how much fluctuation does there exist in terms of the returns about its mean value and this is what is known as the volatility or the variability of the return. So, that is another factor that needs to be taken into account whether the particular asset returns are extremely volatile or less volatile. And consequently, as a result of the first two assumptions, the investor decisions are mainly based on what is the expected return and what is the risk statistics. And as we uh, in later in today's discussion, we will talk in a little more detail about what we mean by expected return and the risk statistic. And finally, and this is an obvious rational uh, way of looking at it, that for a given level of risk. So, if you have two assets with identical amount of risk, the investor is obviously going to go for the one which offers a higher return as compared to the one that has lower returns. Okay, so, let us now uh, formally introduce the concepts of uh, returns and risk. Uh, so, we have already seen in the last class, uh, uh, we have already some idea about what a return is about and we had looked at returns earlier also when we were talking about bonds. But now let us put it in terms of a formalized notational structure. So, accordingly, we will talk first about the various rates of return. And please understand that we will view this view the one period return and present several alternatives for this. Uh, so, for the time being what we will do is that we will look at a one period setup. Uh, remember that in the binomial model we looked at a multi step uh, binomial model. So, if you remember that we started off with the case where there is just a single step. So, we will look at the single step in terms of returns which then can be extended in case of multi step and there are ways of optimizing this such as dynamic programming in the multi step setup. But for the point of view of the mean variance uh, theory that is the Markowitz framework we will primarily restrict ourselves to what happens in a single period and we can repeatedly make use of that uh, one at a time. So, if you start at some time t equal to 0 and at the end of the first period we will reassess and then again use the theory for a single period model up to time t equal to 2 and so on. So, to begin with as I mentioned here that we will talk first about what is the different concepts of returns in a more formal way and we will introduce the notation for the same. So, accordingly uh, we first of all we will talk about what is known as the holding period return that means the period for which you are in ownership of uh, the, the asset. So, accordingly uh, let me introduce some notations. So, I will say let P naught this be the price at which a stock and by stock I basically mean a risky asset in gen general. 
So, this is the uh, price for which a stock is purchased by an investor at the beginning of the holding period. Then let P1 be the price at which the stock is sold by the investor at the end of the period and this period could be for example say uh, one year. Now uh, during this period period what is D1 going to be? It is going to be dividends received. Okay, so, basically these are the cash transactions that happens during the holding period. Then if the notation R1 denotes the rate of return for the holding period that is from 0 to 1, then what does it mean? So, this means that if you make an investment of P0 at the end of the period, it will grow by a factor of 1 plus R1 and this is the same as the final amount of money P1 that you have received plus D1 which is your dividend return. And this implies that R1 is equal to P1 minus P0 divided by P0 and on the numerator I have a plus D1. So, this means that it, it is that P1 minus P0 is the excess amount of money uh, that you get as a result of selling the stock and D1 is the dividend. So, this is the total net gain that you have during the entire period and this as a proportion of the initial investment P0, this is what is known as the return. And this return money that the amount that you get, it has if you multiply it by 100, then you basically get the equivalent uh, return in terms of percentage. So, just a little example, uh, sort of very straightforward example that uh, if you have purchased the stock for 100 and at the end of one year you sell it for 107 and during this one year period you have received a dividend of 8, then the return is going to be P1 minus P0. So, that is 107 minus 100 plus the dividend which is 8 divided by the original amount of 100 which is equal to 0 0.15 or if you multiply it with 100 this becomes equal to 15 percent. Okay, uh, so, what you we now talked about the return for a stock. Uh, so, in case of a bond say you have a coupon paying bond So, again the same thing, suppose that you purchase the bond for an amount of P0 at the end of one year you sell it for P1 and in the intervening period you receive a coupon of C, then your gain is going to be P1 minus P0 plus C divided by original P0, where uh, C is the coupon paid during the holding period. So, we have given the basic definition for return in case of a stock and a bond for a single holding period. Okay, so, now let us now look at uh, the next thing that we will look at is uh, what is known as the uh, after tax return. So, we will now just we will now generalize uh, the definition of returns for the holding period to include uh, tax, tax liabilities that arises. So, for the after tax return, I will introduce two notations. So, let tau a be the rate of capital gains tax and tau o be the rate of ordinary income tax. Uh, so, this means that tau uh, g 
that you have here. So, so uh, this is tau g not a. So, just make this correction. This is tau g. So, g stands for capital gains. So, capital gains in the context of this discussion is basically the amount or the difference in the amount of money uh, uh, that you get as a result of selling the asset. So, if you purchase this asset for p naught and uh, sell the asset for p 1, then your uh, capital gains income is going to be the difference between the two and this is taxable in, in, in many countries. And Tau, uh, uh, tau O is the rate of ordinary income tax. So, basically this is the, the tax rate that is applicable to your regular income and dividends are considered as regular incomes. So, accordingly we now need to modify the rate of return to incorporate these two tax rates. So, this gives us that the rate of return R. So, as before this is going to be P1 minus P0 plus your D1 divided by P0. But please remember that on the amount of P1 minus P0, you have to pay at capital gains tax at the rate of tau g. So, that means the amount of money that it remains with you is P1 minus P0 into 1 minus tau g. And also for the dividend, you have to pay the income tax at the ordinary rate. So, that means on the amount of D1 after having paid uh, the ordinary income tax at rate uh, tau o you are left with an amount of d1 into 1 minus tau o. Okay. Uh, and the last thing that I want to talk about uh, is uh, this is discrete and continuously compounded rate. And this is something that I had broached upon uh, in, the, in the last class, but I will just recall this that uh, if we have two time periods uh, 0 and 1, then your p at 1 is going to be p 0 and if the r is the annual interest rate, then this is and it is paid m times a year. So, this is going to be p naught into 1 plus r over m into m. And then in general, if it is for t number of years, this is going to be p naught into 1 plus r by m into m of t. And the continuous version of this is going to be that, so that this, this is the discrete and the continuous version for this as we had done in the previous class is going to be that generically p of t, this is going to be p naught into e raised to some r of t or some r prime of t. So, we denote this by say r, r prime just to distinguish this. Okay. And there is just one more uh, return that I want to talk about and this is what is known as the log return. So, if you for example, have consider a time window say t minus 1 and t 2 consecutive time point, then the return r t which is the log return is given by the natural log of price of the asset at time t over price of the asset at time t minus 1. All right. So, now that we have defined what a return is now and we recognize the fact that the return is a random variable because you, you know the initial price, but you do not know what uh, the price of the asset is going to be at the time you sell it off. So, accordingly we need to talk about not just returns, but we need a single number which indicates uh, what we should expect from a particular asset in terms of returns and this brings us to the concept of what is a expected return. So, accordingly, uh, we first recall the definition in the context of this discussion. So, recall that if x is a random variable which takes the values x subscript small s, s equal to 1, 2 all the way to capital S with respective probabilities p subscript small s, small s equal to 1, 2 all the way to s, then the expected value or mean of the random variable E x 
uh, that means the expected value is e of x or uh, that is the expected value of the random variable x is equal to summation p subscript small s into x subscript small s s equal to 1 to capital S where uh, obviously p subscript small s small s equal to 1 to capital S is going to be equal to 1. So, now let us look at uh, extend this notion to the expected return of a security and obviously I mean uh, mostly in the point of view of uh, risky security. So, we now consider the return R from a risky security as the random variable. So, here I am choosing the candidate for x uh, to be the return from any particular asset. So, accordingly uh, what you do is that, so this so, now I am I will now extend this uh, definition of E x here to that of the return of a security. So, accordingly if R i is the random variable representing the return on security i. So, I, I choose some generic security which I call the i s security. then the expected return is given as follows and this is given by expectation of the random variable which is r i for the i s security. This will be given by summation p subscript s s equal to 1 to capital S into r i comma small s. So, note that here that this random variable r i will take possible values of r i s with the corresponding probability of p subscript of small s. So, this is something like that this is going to be uh, this is the random variable and uh, this random variable is the return of a stock price and I am saying that under capital S number of different scenarios. That means, uh, so if I choose a generic scenario say small s then for that the random variable r i will take the value of r i subscript of s with the corresponding probability of p subscript of small s. So, an example for this could be that uh, this small s s equal to 1 to capital S so that this capital S number of things could be uh, the state of the economy. So, in particular if you go back to the binomial model you can actually see this p of s uh, these are going to be p and 1 minus p and the return r i s there are two possible values that the, namely your u and d given by the upward and the downward movement. So, likewise you could have another model where you basically have a much larger number of such possible values of r i subscript of s. However, as we will later see that uh, from the practical implementation point of view it is very difficult to figure out what this p of subscript s are going to be. So, in practice we will see towards the end of this lecture that the an alternative way of calculating the expectation is going to be uh, using the historical data. Okay, now, coming back to this uh, general discussion. So, here so I have calculated the expected return. So, now once we have talked about expectation here and the expected return of the security. So, now we move on to the next pillar of the Markowitz model namely the risk. So, here in the context of the discussion the word risk is synonymous with the deviation of outcomes from the expected value. So, accordingly, 
So, if I again uh, look at the uh, counterpart of this definition of expectation and then I will extend this specifically to uh, uh, risk security. So, accordingly we consider the variance or standard deviation about the expected value. So, uh, that is sigma x square is going to is e. So, you recall the definition that this is e of uh, uh, x minus e x square and this in the notation of probability and random variable in this discussion, this is going to be summation of p s x s minus e of x square small s equal to 1 to capital S and standard deviation of x is equal to square root of sigma x square. And now we are in a position uh, to talk about the risk of a security. So, uh, the discussion of the risk of a security uh, will emphasize on the dispersion of the securities rate of return about its expected value accordingly the standard deviation Uh, or equivalently of the variance of rates of return qualifies as an obvious candidate for the measure of risk. Uh, so, just to sort of uh, elaborate a little bit on this, uh, what I mean is that as we have already identified that uh, the deviation from the expected value which is the average value is an indicator of uh, how volatile the movement of the random variable is and in this context we are worried about the volatility of the return. So, accordingly uh, the obvious choice for this is that we look at the deviation of the return from its expected value which you have just now calculated and take the square of it. So, that is and take its expectation which gives us the variance. So, what we will do is that we will mostly be using the variance or equivalently the standard deviation as the measure of risk. So, please uh, take into account that we will use both the standard deviation and the variance depending on the context as the measure of risk and it will become obvious from the, uh, from the discussion, from the context of the specific discussion as to which of these two are being used as the measure of risk at that point of time. Okay. So, then this gives me that, so more specifically, so now again I will now put a formula for uh, uh, the risk. So, more specifically the variance of the i return of the ith asset which are denoted by sigma i square, this is going to be by definition of variance e of r i minus uh, uh, e of r i square and this in terms of probability this is going to be summation p subscript of small s r i uh, comma s minus e of r i square s is equal to 1 to capital 
this. All right. So, so far we have uh, looked at the first two moments of the returns of the assets and, uh, and accordingly we have defined what is the expected value of R i that is U of R i and the variance that is sigma i square. Now, uh, notion of using the variance as a measure of risk is based on the uh, premise that uh, the risk of, a, a, of an asset is primarily or essentially uh, driven by the characteristic of that particular asset. However, in practice, uh, the risk of a particular asset is not exclusively driven by uh, factors that are unique to that particular asset, but also they are driven by the behavior of the market and by extension by the behavior of the other assets that are in the market. So, we also need to take into account the behavior of a particular asset vis-a-vis -vis the behavior of the other assets in the market or equivalently we need to look at the behavior of the returns of the ith asset with every other jth asset that are available in the market. So, accordingly we are now in a position to start talking about what is going to be the covariance of the returns of assets. So, we start off with this definition of covariance of returns and I will just briefly note down the motivation that I have discussed just now. So, uh, the statistical measure of association between two random variables is the covariance. This can be applied in case of price movement of a security being associated with price movement of other securities. So, accordingly, uh, we consider two securities uh, which will identify as the ith and jth security. So, the covariance of returns between these two securities is given by sigma i j is equal to covariance of r i r j and this from the definition of covariance is the expectation of r i minus e of r i and r j minus e of r j. And this in terms of the probabilities is going to be summation p s s equal to 1 to capital S of r i s minus e of r i into r j s minus e of r j, where r i s and r j s are returned on security i and j respectively when state s occurs. Okay, so, just a couple of observation uh, that follows. Uh, first of all is that when i is equal to j, then obviously, sigma i i is going to be e of r i minus e r i uh, square and this is sigma i square. And secondly, uh, using the symmetric property of covariance sigma i j 
is going to be equal to sigma j i. That means the covariance of return of the i and the j th asset is the same as the covariance return of the j th and the i th asset. All right. Uh, so, we now come to the last uh, concept which uh, and the, the one that is a fallout of the covariance of returns and that is the correlation coefficient. So, the correlation of returns. So, recall that the correlation coefficient rho x y of between two uh, random variables x and y is sigma x y over sigma x into sigma y. So, accordingly the correlation coefficient between returns of two assets i and j is given by. So, using this I will denote this by notation rho i j this is sigma i j over sigma i into sigma j. So, uh, if if rho i j is equal to plus 1 then returns. So, this implies that returns of securities i and j move in the same direction at the same time. The second observation and again these are uh, for, uh, similar to the observations that I had made earlier. So, when rho i j is equal to 0 this implies that returns on securities i and j have no tendency at all of following each other. And thirdly, if rho i j is equal to minus 1, uh, this implies that returns of securities i and j vary in an opposite manner or a inverse manner. Uh, so, these three observations are uh, similar to the interpretation of uh, rho is equal to plus minus 1 and rho equal to 0 when we were discussing and when we had introduced earlier the definition of a correlation coefficient between two random variables. Okay, so, now we come to the last topic for today's lecture that is calculating the expected returns and uh, the variance, the covariance and the correlation coefficient based on historical data. So, we talk about estimation using historical data. So, let us see how we can make the uh, historical data. So, by historical data I basically mean that the stock prices uh, or the asset price movements from the past and you can view this as the closing prices at the end of each day and the return is going to be given by the definition uh, of the return that we had introduced uh, earlier in the class without the uh, dividends being taken into account and later on this can be expanded to take the dividends into account. So, now you see that the reason why you have to do this is that the definition of expectation involves certain probabilities and those probabilities are in practice very difficult to ascertain and so are the random variables associated with those probabilities. So, historical data makes the assumption that the possible uh, returns over the say next one day is going to have uh, possible values amongst the returns that are observed in the past say preceding 500 days or preceding 200 days. So, that means that the random variable r i s uh, for the for r i this potentially are values that were observed in the past 
and the other assumption is that the corresponding probabilities for each of those val values occurring again is taken to be all identical. Of course, in a more generalized setup sometimes these probabilities can be designed in a way that more weightage is given in the calculation of the S expectation, more weightage is given to the returns of more recent times as compared to the more distant times. So, just to note down what is the motivation, so the calculations for expectations of these assets, variances and obviously equivalent standard deviation and covariances and by extension correlation coefficients already discussed are based on probabilities. However, as I have already mentioned from a practical point of view, these probabilities that means the probability p subscript of little s of future events are difficult to ascertain. So, accordingly in this case the historical observations can be used to estimate the expected return variance and covariance. So, it is convenient to assume that each observation uh, from the past is equally likely with the same probability. Let T be the number of historical return observations being used. Uh, so, this means that there are actually capital T plus 1 number of historical data points and which will give us capital T number of historical observations. So, this means that the probability if all the such observations are likely to be repeated and are taken as the random variable RIS, then the assumption of them likely to happen uh, uh, with equal probability means that each of those probabilities is going to be 1 divided by the number of observations of return that is capital T. So, that means each of the probabilities is going to be 1 over T. So, accordingly based on the historical data we can calculate. So, therefore, we can calculate uh, expected return variance and covariance. So, accordingly we have the following three things or actually four things. Uh, the first of one is the estimate of expected return of security i which I will denote by r i bar and this will be 1 over t summation r i t t is equal to 1 to capital T where r i t is security i's rate of return at time small t. Secondly, we look at estimate of variance of returns of 
security i, these are denoted by sigma i square hat and this is going to be 1 over t minus 1 summation t is equal to 1 to capital T r i t minus r i bar square. So, here I want to briefly pause and just point out that this expression that is used to estimate the expected return, this is an unbiased estimator of the mean and this est estimator that is being used to estimate the variance where we have a factor of 1 over t minus 1 instead of 1 over t that is also an unbiased estimator of the of the uh, variance. So, if you look at uh, if you if you for this you can look up uh, any uh, uh, statistics text on unbiased estimators. So, thirdly the estimate of covariance and of course, uh, we should not forget the correlation coefficients of securities i and j this is given by sigma i j hat for the estimator again 1 divided by t minus 1 summation. So, I will, I will follow the uh, the, uh, the same pattern as the unbiased estimator for variance. So, this will be summation of r i t minus r i bar into r j t minus r j bar t is equal to 1 to capital T and rho i hat j is sigma i j hat which I have calculated here divided by sigma i hat into sigma j hat which I have been estimated here. Okay, so, so, this gives us basically a historical way, uh, the, a way to make use of the historical data to estimate the basic data sets that are needed in order to move on to a portfolio optimization process, namely an estimate of the expected return, an estimate of the variance and the estimate of the covariance and equivalently of the uh, correlation coefficients. So, just to sum up what we have discussed in today's class, we started our discussion on the um, modern portfolio theory and, why, and we identified that uh, the two important characteristic of the modern portfolio theory are return and risk and accordingly we have defined what is the return and what is the risk in case of the returns of uh, risky securities and then uh, we also defined what is going to be the covariance of return between the two. Uh, risky securities and the correlation coefficient which are necessary to identify the uh, behavioral pattern of uh, the of a risky security that is in terms of the risk of a particular security i uh, in the paradigm of movement of the risky securities the other risky securities that are available in the market. And finally, identifying the difficulty in using uh, the basic definition of uh, these three uh, uh, parameters namely the uh, expectation, the variance and the covariance slash correlation coefficient. Uh, we have given three approaches to estimate all this all of them making use of the historical data of or the securities. So, in the next class we will uh, extend more of the discussion and we will make use of the properties of expectation and variance to introduce our discussion of uh, determining what is going to be a best portfolio and first we start looking at a two asset portfolio and then we will look at a more generalized case. Thank you for watching.